Hello everybody, welcome to Alan Wall's Photography. I hope you didn't forget that it was orange shirt day today. I have a feeling that some of you probably did. Today we're going to revisit my macro cage and I'm going to show you a few of the tweaks that I made to it. I'm also going to introduce a new project that I just launched that I think you're going to be interested in and want to participate in. The third thing, which is really part of the first thing, is I'm gonna show you some more advanced lighting techniques that will help you get rid of some of the common and irritating problems with higher magnification macro using a cage. Sounds interesting. <laughs> So before we get started, I'm going to share with you one piece of ancient Himalayan wisdom. The more super clamps and bendy arms you own, the more super clamps and bendy arms you will use. When I put together the first macro cage video, I was putting together the same kind of cage that I've been using for years. It's pretty much designed to use with macro lenses and with uh, reversed primes. It's not a high magnification setup. Though, uh, with the, with the uh, booming interest in high magnification from you guys, uh, I've been using it more and more for that. Back in the day, I used to use an open system for extreme macro. Uh, it gave me a lot more room for creative lighting positioning. It was less cramped and uh, it was just a little bit easier to use. But I've now modified my cage to work better than an open system. And seeing as I've made some, uh, some fairly significant changes in how I have it built and how I use it, I thought it would be good to share them with you. This all started when um, Nats from uh, New Zealand, that's without a G, um, got in touch and asked me what, uh, what adaptations should she make to a macro cage if she was going to base it around using an automated focus rail, which was not part of the uh, original design that I shared because, of course, using it with a macro lens uh, I was primarily using it with a manual rail. So I have made some changes to it and I'd like to walk you through those changes, show you what I did and why I did it. So the first thing that I had to do in order to get the kind of stability that I needed from a, a platform that was going to be holding a, um, a Cognosys stack shot I needed a much less mobile base. Uh, the slider base that uh, I'd originally built for the cage was fantastic for macro lenses because of course your working distance would fluctuate wildly depending on how you focused your lens. So I, I found it very useful to have all of that space. Of course, when you're doing high magnification photography, you need about an inch of play forward and backward is all, all you're ever gonna need um, because you're operating at the, at the minimum focus distance of your equipment. So you just don't need to be able to move the base. And it was probably just because of the way I built mine. Um, the base wasn't really as, as tight as I would like it to be. Um, by that I mean <clears throat> I'd built the rails about a millimeter too far apart and there was some lateral play, um, which if I bumped the camera or bumped the, the manual rail during a shoot, I could knock the camera offline. And that, that just wasn't gonna work with high magnification stuff. So the first thing I did was I built a new base as you can see here, the base that I had has been replaced by a larger sandwich of MDF in the middle with two pieces of high quality plywood on either side. This is heavy uh, because of the MDF and it is very true because of the plywood uh, and it is solid. It is like a 
sheet of steel. It's, uh, it's very heavy and it is uh, attached with the three big bolts that go all the way through to the bottom of the table. Uh, it covers up the groove that used to be there, but if I ever want to go back to using this with a macro lens, I can remove the top piece and, and replace the, the slidey carriage. Uh, but this has made a really significant difference in, in keeping the camera, the bellows, everything lower, lower center of gravity and uh, very, very stable. I haven't had many issues at all with vibration. I accidentally left my washing machine running while I was doing a stack the other day. And uh, normally that would totally ruin the stack, but there were only one or two slightly blurry pictures. That's when my spin cycle does something weird. It's 20 years old. It's a wonder it still washes clothes. In addition to this being much sturdier, I also built it long enough uh, to hold the stack shot control box where it would keep it up out of the way. And uh, yes, it's been, it's been very helpful that way. Okay, the, uh, the next thing that I want to cover is the ever evolving platform for the specimen. Now, with lower magnification, I was using, initially I was using just a, a a, a, a sturdy base with um, a clamp attached to it. Uh, but after Alan Rechtenwald came up with the brilliant idea he had of, of using uh, an articulating arm with um, a clamp on one end and an X-Acto knife on the other for holding the pins, uh, I used that a lot for uh, medium macro, uh, you know, 4X type stuff. But I needed something that gave me better control of the specimen. As much as I liked the bendy arm, uh, I still found myself having a hard time getting my specimen positioned, posed, if you will, exactly where I wanted it in the frame because of the coarseness of the movements of the articulating arm. So what I did was I took two pieces of gear and uh, I, I put them together. As you can see, the first is uh, a lab lifter. We've talked about that before and I've, I've used it in other setups before. On top of that is an X, Y, and Z trimming table um, used for precision movements. The reason I haven't been using mine is there's nothing precision about this piece of junk, but it does have a lot of bulk and uh, it does give me movement in about two of the axes still work. Uh, so that helps. And I have been using that position uh, directly on the, the center uh, axis of the camera and the rail. As I actually have bolted these things together, you should have seen the night I drilled four holes in that lab lifter. I used every drill bit that I own that metal stuff's strong. Uh, but anyway, what I have settled on now is actually moving the lab lifter and the XYZ trim table off axis and moved it to the side, which has some real benefits. Number one, it puts all of the controls of the XYZ table right at my fingertips. Instead of having to reach around to the front of the, uh, of the camera from one side or the other, to make tweaks in the position of the specimen. Now they're all comfortably at the end of my right hand. You'll see in the base that I built, which is similar to the camera base, it's only uh, two pieces of plywood and it is screwed um, in firmly to the base. Uh, you'll notice I, I used a Forstner bit to make four shallow holes exactly the size of the feet on the lab lifter. And I filled them with uh, blue tack. And so when I push the lab lifter down into those holes, it stays completely stable. It doesn't wiggle or wobble or anything. It's, it's solid. Uh, that, that really, really helps. And I recommend that, that you do it, even if you're not putting the the lifter down in holes, just putting blue tack on the feet will help uh, hold it stable and flat. Uh, 
But the real genius of, of moving this off to the side uh, was, again, thanks to Alan Rechtenwald, um, who comes up with the best uh, engineering ideas for these problems. Uh, he was kind enough to send me uh, th this device you see here, which is called a captive something something. <laughs> <laughs> I've been calling it a pin clamp because it clamps pins, but it is absolutely perfect for the job. It's sturdy enough and heavy enough that it doesn't vibrate. It holds easily into the, the, uh, the jaws of the alligator clamp, and it is a piece of cake to release the pin to, uh, to take my specimen out and then to position the next one. And because it is off uh, plane like this, it frees up room in front of the macro rail. If you've been doing this with an automated rail and a bellows, you know that you've got to be constantly mindful of where the front of the bellows is because it, it would not be uh, difficult to advance it in such a way that the end of the bellows knocked in uh, to the platform uh, that the specimen is on. But now I have that six inches to the right and it can't touch it. So it doesn't matter what's going on with the, the rail, this is out of the way. The only problem you could have is running into your, your specimen, but hopefully you, you're doing that while you're watching. So those are the two basic uh, structural changes, adding a more stable platform and permanently attaching the stack shot to the platform, adding a sturdy specimen platform uh, for when I want the specimen in front of the uh, objective. And the second is repositioning the uh, specimen table, the, all of the adjustment controls off to the side of the axis of the uh, objective which has been hugely helpful. So everything else I wanna talk about is related to lighting. Let me first tell you uh, about the problem that I'm trying to fix. Have you ever done a, a, a stack using your macro cage, using a, a couple of flashes uh, and ended up with an image like this or like this? Well, if you have, you know how incredibly frustrating it is because the, uh, the intense specularity that you get in images like this is really impossible to fix. These photographs aren't, aren't salvageable. Uh, and it's very frustrating and it happens quite a lot. And the reason is, even when you're using a carefully constructed uh, diffusion device, like my diffusion tubes, which I, I absolutely love and still use. It's just a tube of tracing paper uh, with a groove cut in the bottom and a, a little wooden stick to, to hold it in position. But the way I used this uh, was to hold this with the specimen about halfway down the tube through this groove, something like that. And then I would fire my flashes from outside the tube. But because of the, the closeness of the flashes, it was still difficult to get rid of the specularity. So I decided to, to refit my cage so that I could revert to the kind of lighting I've always used in the past. The problem is that flashes put out an intense short burst of light and anything that is going to reflect that light uh, back into your objective runs the risk of reflecting back a blown out specular highlight. And if you have enough of that, and you have enough of that going on in the hairs or bristles of an insect, uh, your stacking program gets very confused. It doesn't know what to do. Just like the stacking program is not sure what to do with areas that are underexposed, uh, crevices in the shadows, it has trouble stacking those because there isn't enough data about what the detail is in there. 
It's the same with specular highlights. And uh, when that occurs around hairs and bristles, it's impossible to get rid of the haloing and the ghosting that you see uh, after you run your stack. There are two components to it. The first is there are three components. <laughs> There are three main components to, to the way I light for 10x and above. And I've actually started using it at 4x as well because it really works so well. The main difference is this. I no longer use direct lighting in shiny or reflective beetles or anything with a fairly high contrast. You remember my quad hands? that everybody then went out and bought a quad hands. My quad hands has been amputated, a quadruple amputee quad hands. It's probably just a quad now. <laughs> oh dear, I did keep the feet. They're gonna be, they're gonna be handy for something. What I did was I took each of my quad hands and um, I attached it to a trusty super clamp and a little um, you know, mounting thingamajig for studio lights, just to give me a little added length. And this is screwed on very, very tight. You can attach this anywhere uh, in the cage, obviously, that's, that's the reason we built the cage. Each of my lights is attached to an articulating arm, and the light is directed into a bendy arm reflector like this. I've got cards cut out of every conceivable size. Uh, I glued black card on the back of them so they function as flags as well when I need a flag, as sometimes you do with this. But it's simply a matter of positioning the flash and then positioning the reflector for that flash. And all of the other changes that I've made, especially moving the specimen platform off axis, creates a vast space around the end of the objective, which is you couldn't do this if your platform was right under the objective. There wouldn't be room. But with the, with the platform moved over, there's plenty of room to do that. And that couldn't happen if it wasn't for the Allen rectum wall pin grabber. Um, so I just picked a couple of small cards for this demonstration. I, uh, I have small bendy arms and, sorry, I have small bendy arms and long bendy arms, depending on how I want to use the light. But this way, I, c I still have the light quartering in from the front so that I'm getting uh, I'm getting the light right where I want it. And I have a couple of cards where I have cut a semicircle out of the edge so that I can put some of the cards right on top of the objective and get the light bouncing back. I still use a diffusion tube uh, and I just use my reflected light onto the, the tube so it gives it an additional uh, softening before it gets to the subject. Obviously, because you're adding distance, you're going to have to add a little power. Uh, so I'll, I'll set a shot up. In fact, I'll grab a specimen and uh, show you start to finish how I do this. But before that, there's one other really, really important tweak that I would like to recommend to you that has made a massive difference. So as I started using reflected light, I started to notice that I was still getting some ugly um, light changes that I was having a hard time putting my finger on. Um, it turned out that it was the objective. Now, I ever since, ever since I got one of these 4X objectives, I have not been uh, fond of the, the brightly polished metal. It's just a setup for, for problems. And when you're bouncing light around, uh, the risk of, of setting up reflections inside the barrel of the objective became something to, to be concerned about. 
So I gradually made a number of uh, modifications to the objective until I hit on the, the, the best way to go about it. And I want to share that with you. Now, I, I never actually, I, when I ordered this Amscope ob, uh, objective, I ordered um, a couple of adapters for it, RMS to, uh, to regular uh, F-mount adapters. I ordered one in January. Um, it never showed up. And like an idiot, I ordered a second one in April and it hasn't showed up either. Um, I, I doubt they'll ever show up, but um, in the meantime, I'm perfectly happy with what I use, which is just the, the, the lens holder, the case it comes in, the lid of that with a hole drilled in it uh, and epoxied onto uh, an F-mount uh, body cap for an Icon camera. Uh, and this works perfectly well. But the issue that I was, uh, was having was first of all, light bouncing off the exterior of the barrel and ending up places that I didn't want it. And second, reflections off the flat end of the uh, objective barrel and from light bouncing around down inside the, uh, uh, the objective itself. So what I did was a number of things. First of all, um, and I recommend you do this too, I, I removed the outer sleeve of the objective to make it, that was just to make it narrower and easier to work with. Um, and then I applied some self-adhesive felt flocking material around the uh, end with a little bit of overlap down the sides. I didn't want to put this cheap felt flocking down inside the objective, um, just because this is this is not good flocking material. It, it does shed occasional fibers, but I still wanted to blacken the inside of the objective all the way to the uh, front element of the objective, which is a good centimeter down in there. And that's when I stumbled across this idea. I use these, these uh, Velcro ties for a million things. I have them, I've probably got 15 of them attached to things just for my video. Um, and if you look closely at one of these, they are uh, the hook, hooky side on one side, and the other side is very soft. And uh, if, if you look at it, you'll notice it doesn't have any reflective surfaces. It's like a very, fine, soft felt. The other thing is they come bending in this orientation. The, the hooky part is always on the outside of the bend. That's the way the roll comes. I buy them in a big roll. Uh, so when you take them off, they always curve like this, which gave me an idea. Um, and uh, after I did some measurements, I discovered that this regular strip is exactly the same distance from the top of the objective barrel to the front element. And there is a shelf inside there, so it doesn't go straight onto the glass. There's a little shelf. Uh, so I cut this to the exact size. I had to do it a couple of times and then rolled it up. I'll just, I'll do exactly what I did. I've got one down in there that I, I'm not gonna take out, but. I cut it to the right size, rolled it into a circle like that. And then without using any tape or any glue or anything, I just positioned it inside the objective and it springs back open to fill the space. Uh, and amazingly, it, it positions itself right up against the wall and out of the uh, uh, flow of light. Um, and it makes a massive difference. It really does. Hard to describe. Well, I won't describe. I'll just show you some more pictures. This is the, this is the kind of problem I was having without these modifications to the objective. And um, yeah, this is, uh, this is what the photographs start to look like as soon as I cut down on the... the um, uh, reflections inside the objective. Now, 
to deal with the outside of the objective, which I also, like I say, I didn't like, I took a, a, a small piece of, um, this is homemade flocking material. It's just a, it's a piece of felt stuck onto a piece of black cardboard. Um, and uh, this, I use this for flags and all kinds of other things. I always have several sheets of this made up, but I cut a small piece, rolled it in a hoop like this, stuck it together with Gorilla Tape, and it fits like a glove over the objective. If you've ever photographed um, jumping spiders with a 4X objective, you'll know how irritating it is to have six massive reflections of your objective right in the middle of their eyes. This doesn't get rid of them, but it makes them much harder to see and much more, more subtle. So I don't think any of my other lighting modifications would have worked if I hadn't done this. Uh, so I urge you to get hold of some good flocking material, the real thing. I'll put a link in the, in the uh, program notes so you can see where you can get it. Uh, Protostar is the name of the, the brand. B&H uh, doesn't carry Protostar, but you can find it on eBay. Um, B&H carries a different brand. It's, it's obscenely expensive, but um, yeah, but it's the, it's the real deal. I always keep a packet of this stuff around too, just for completeness sake. This is, this is self-adhesive um, felt with the sticky backing that I got at a, a, a local hobby shop. Um, it's pretty good, but if you're going to, if you're going to use this stuff, buy a lint roller, that's what it is. And give these sheets a really good roll several times to pull off any loose fibers. Otherwise, they will end up on your objective lens or worse, if you're using it in an extension tube, they'll end up uh, on your sensor. One other thing, or two other things, while I'm, while I'm getting my specimen prepared, um, I wanted to tell you about a trick when you're when you're trying to position a little piece of velcro uh, closure or if you're trying to put a piece of sticky flocking down inside uh, your 4x objective wrap it around a round pencil or crayon it's slightly smaller than than the uh, hole in the objective but it has a nice flat end. All you have to do is once you've cut the piece to size is wrap it around the pencil with the smooth side inside, obviously. Slide it down into the objective and then pull the pencil back out and it will pop open. If you're using sticky back material down in there, do the same thing to put it in. But once you put it in, make a circular rolling motion with your pencil all the way around the inside of the objective to make sure the adhesive binds to the walls of the objective on the inside. I forgot to mention that. The other thing has absolutely nothing to do with anything that we're talking about today. I just want to show you what I found. I am really bad about buying containers for things. <laughs> I've Everything, everything that I own, all my macro stuff is in tiny containers. But I've always wanted something like this. And this has really very high quality plastic bottles with plastic lids that are all see-through that fit in this box. And there's like 18 of them. No, no, it's more than that. It's 30, 30 of them, 30 bottles in this tray with a lid perfect for single specimens to keep them from getting discolored by other specimens it was about nine dollars at the hobby shop but uh, this is 
This is a must have, I will definitely be using it. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and pick out a, a specimen from a, a recent hunt and uh, we'll go ahead and get it positioned. My house was recently treated for uh, cockroaches, which I don't have, or I didn't have until this morning. Uh, but for some bizarre reason over the last three or four weeks, it's probably because I brought some eggs in from one of my hunts. Uh, but uh, my, my house has been infested with uh, little wasps. They're, um, they're good wasps. Their food of choice is eating the eggs of cockroaches, believe it or not. So then if you're going to have wasps in your house, it's a pretty good one to have, but I killed them. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is all they are. They're very small, but uh, they're really pretty. Should we use him? I haven't washed this guy. No, I'm gonna use something that's been washed. All right, here's an interesting looking fly with a big long nose. It's gonna take me a while to to get this guy dried, but uh, I will dry him and pin him. And then we'll go over and I'll show you how I set up the lighting. So the first thing that we need to do is set up the specimen. So to use the pin grabber, all you have to do is decide where you want your specimen positioned. And I think we'll, we'll do him from the left side of his face there. You have to just push the end of the captive hook thingamajig like so and release it and it will grab the pin and it won't let go. Now if you need to rotate it to straighten the subject you can. All right so once the specimen is clipped on I can use the I can use the fine adjustments that work on the, on the um, trimming table to position my guy right where I want him. As far as positioning him uh, distance from the end of the objective, I would do that with the focusing rail. So as you can see, I would normally be sitting down at the end of the table here. It's very easy for me to to reach forward and make any adjustments that I need to on the fly. So that, uh, that, that is how I would get him positioned. And then while I had all the lights on, I'd make sure that he was posed the way I wanted him. Then I would start with the lights. Now I do this backwards. The, the flashes are the last thing I position. I start out by positioning what will become the primary light source, which is the reflectors. Now, I want to have light coming from the left side straight towards his left eye. So I'm going to need a reflector that is positioned like that. But you'll see I can't position it uh, perpendicular to the base Otherwise, my flash is going to have to hit the subject on the way to the reflector. So what I'm going to do is position it down so that my first flash is going to be coming from above. I think that would be about right. So I figure out where my closest stable attachment is and attach the, the clamp. As you can imagine, this takes a lot of fidgety movement to get it right. Now, I will probably use this flash for that light and I will position it right about there so that only the reflected light, in fact, let's just put it there while I've got it up. just like so. So none of this column of light is going to hit the uh, insect. It's all going to hit the card 
and be deflected back up to the insect. Now, you know what we could do is just take a, a single shot with it just like that. I'm going to turn the flash on using, again, the short distance setting. Hold the test button for two seconds and then turn the thing on. So hopefully that will control the flash. So we've just got the one flash now. Normally I would set this up at the beginning of the stack, but for this demonstration, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna get one eye and focus. And of course I've got it on mirror up mode. Ah, I'm very happy with that already. Now, I want the second light shining down from above the objective in this direction. That looks about what I want. So I'll position this like so. Let's see what that looks like. I think I'm gonna bring it up a little bit. Now the beauty of this is I can just unclamp it and move it. Now, if you were trying to do this without the flocking uh, on the objective, you'd be getting all kinds of light bouncing around there. So let's see how that does. Probably should turn this on. All right, well, that's blowing out the top of his eyeball. I'm going to have to turn that way down. You'll notice that I don't have my uh, diffusion tube in place yet, and that is also going to cut down on how much light is getting through here. As I was telling you earlier, this would be really difficult to set up if you had uh, if you had all of this equipment right here sitting here. I like my diffusion tube to go around the insect pin, not the not the grabber. Okay, let's see what that does. All right, now. The next thing that I would do once I'm happy with my two primary lights is I would attach my, my background, uh, which is just a sheet of light blue card uh, or whatever color I want to use. Um, and I attach it there. And then I use another bendy arm to attach a third flash to the cross beam and have that light pointing down to the end of the tube that gives a nice uh, circular uh, ball of, of pale blue that will that will outline the um, uh, the subject that's going to be primarily lit from here so it just makes for a nice believable sky like background that is it that's how these modifications all work together to help you overcome the, the problems of direct flash on your subject. And uh, yes, it's a pain to set up um, and it takes a good bit longer, uh, but um, it's worth every second of it because the, the difference is, uh, is remarkable. All right, I'm not gonna focus stack this guy. I'll just get on to me telling you about the new project I have in the works. Now, all of those changes combined, moving the specimen table out of the way, flocking the uh, objective, using reflected light and diffusion uh, instead of just the diffusion, and uh, having a sturdier platform to the rail to operate on, all of these things taken together have uh, dramatically improved some of the disappointing uh, images that I've been struggling with since using this uh, uh, this cage for higher magnification. I am definitely gonna have to get another quad hands. I, I'm hoping that you can buy just the hands and not the quad because uh, I don't wanna uh, 
I don't want to get another big yellow cross of metal that I'm not going to use. I'm sure somebody sells just the arms. Uh, but anyway, now let me tell you about the new project before you go. Like I said, when I first uh, presented this platform, it was, um, it was not something I expected there to be any interest in. I thought this was just me and my gadgets and uh, uh, you know, nobody would be much interested. Uh, but that is not the case. As delighted as I was when I saw that other people were interested in this idea and began sending me pictures of their, uh, their interpretation of the build, uh, the more impressed I became because almost every one of them had improved on some feature or other. So the more people that would send me photographs, the more obvious it became that uh, I had by no means uh, come up with the best design for a, uh, for a macro cage. In fact, mine was looking pretty shoddy compared to some of the work that folk were showing me. And it occurred to me just the other day, what a fantastic resource it would be if there was a place that macro photographers who were interested in this kind of thing could go and look through a bunch of different interpretations on this concept. And that is what I'd like to propose doing, to set up kind of like a macro cage clearinghouse where uh, anybody who's interested could go to that page and thumb through a dozen or so different ideas of how to do this. So here's what I want to ask of you. If you have built a macro cage, would you kindly send me a nice photograph of it, the best photograph you can get of it, maybe with a, a camera, but it doesn't have to be. It can be, a, it can be a phone shot. But the important thing is to get a couple of additional photographs of anything that you have come up with, any of, any of your ideas. Whether somebody else has done them or not does not matter. But the things that, that make your cage better for you, the things that you've modified because you thought, oh, this would be more stable if it had square tubing on the legs, that type of thing. And uh, if you could send me uh, a, a few photographs of your cage, especially close-up photographs of anything that you've done differently, anything that you've added, if you used a different kind of rail and you've mounted it differently, whatever, whatever you have done to make it your rail, if you could send me those pictures and maybe a few notes, I'll arrange everything. I'll put it all into the format for the website. You don't have to mess with that. If you just send me a few notes about what you've done, what you've done differently, um, what makes yours uh, more useful for you for the way you're using it, that type of thing. Maybe you've built diffusion panels that hang off the side or you're using a different kind of clamp or bendy arm. You get what I'm talking about. Um, if we get a decent response, then uh, we can put this all up on a page on my website and direct people uh, who come along in the future to a, a great resource for them to look at what other folks have come up with and what would work best in their situation. The more uh, the more information you can give, the better, obviously. Um, but uh, I'm not a, I'm not asking you to to give cut lists or diagrams of uh, of how it was made. Um, that that would be above and beyond uh, uh, the call. Just photographs should be enough to get people inspired and interested and give them some fresh ideas. They, they don't want to just see my idea because it's mine's about the most basic idea there is. Uh, they're going to want to see the ones that uh, you guys have come up with. So. If you'd be interested in that, please just send uh, send the photographs to uh, my email address. Does anybody know what that is? 
contact at Alan Walls Photography and just put cage in the um, in the line. And anything you want me to include, so if you've named your cage, give me the name and your name, otherwise it'll be your name cage will be the name of it. <laughs> so um, that would be great. And uh, I look forward to, to hearing from anybody who's uh, interested in doing that. And if you have any other ideas how that page could be even more useful, uh, or enjoyable for people to browse. For example, if you also want to include a couple of your your favorite shots that you've done with the setup that you're showing, that would be fantastic too. Because I know people who are new to this, uh, if they if they can see what you have accomplished with it, they are far more likely to get interested in it than if they just see what I've done. If you go to my website, which is www.allenwallsphotography.com, there will be a page up there called The Cage Project, unless I think of a better name. That will probably be The Cage Project. If you go to that page, it will list for you the things that, that you can send me if you want to, to participate. Um, so. You don't have to remember anything I said today, except to check it out. I'm excited about it. I think it's a good thing uh, that could be given back to the macro community for years to come. Anyhow, that's all I have uh, for you today. Uh, I really appreciate everything you guys do. Thank you very much to my uh, Patreon supporters. Your support is um, most appreciated. Also to the folks that have contributed through my donation page on the website. Uh, it all helps. It really does. Um, coming up next, I think I'm probably going to do the slabbing video that a lot of people have been asking for. Uh, slabbing is a special technique of focus stacking that works uh, to iron out some of the problems with specific types of subject and I'll explain all of that uh, uh, when we do the video. I'll talk to you in a few days and uh, until then, take care, stay safe, enjoy the early summer and uh, uh, avoid viruses, avoid viruses at all costs. Farewell. <laughs>